Hey everybody, um, I appreciate y'all coming on a Tuesday. I know we usually meet on Mondays, but something came up yesterday and I couldn't. And so we rescheduled to this day. I may be doing this the, th the week of Thanksgiving too, because I'm have family in from out of state and I might they might not be around the house on Tuesday. And so I might just teach on Tuesday, two weeks from now instead of Monday, the week of Thanksgiving. I'll keep everybody posted. Well, um, we're going to pray and invite some people to the study. I ask you to, um, to pray with me. Father God, I ask you to be with us right now while we do this Bible study. I ask that you be with us, that you actually teach the Bible study through us. I ask that you be with us. And, and Father, I ask that you show us the things that you would like us to know. And, uh, and more than anything, we want to know you. So I praise you for that, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before we get started, I want to uh, share something um, that I'm real excited about. There is a Bible program, and its name is eSword. And I used other ones for a long time. Uh, I got this one a few years ago, maybe, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. You can get the King James and the King James of Strong's numbers for free. All you have to do is, is um, Google or Bing or whatever it is you do. Search for that, esort.com, I think it is. Um, I have a number of, um, I have everything I have pretty much. On my desktop, I can look at the Amplified, the American Standard, the Complete Jewish Bible, the King James, King James with Strong Numbers, Message, New American Standard, New American Standard with Strong Numbers, NIV, New King James, Revised Version, Tree of Life Version, Young's Literal Translation, and a whole bunch of commentaries. I, I mean, probably um, 30, maybe 25 commentaries. In addition, uh, today I purchased uh, something I've been wanting for a long time, and that is um, the uh, Word Study, Complete Word Study Dictionary in English and, I'm sorry, in Hebrew and in Greek. And I have, I bought these things, I have them on paper, I'll probably still use that, but I've been wanting it digitally, it's on there, it is probably the best resource outside of commentaries I've ever used, I use them all the time. And so today for I think uh, $30 I was able to buy the Hebrew and the Greek word dictionaries. It looks at the words in context with all the modifiers around it. I don't know anything about Greek or anything about Hebrew, but I use these programs and I've been using this on paper. So now uh, it's available on the computer. I just want to recommend it, eSword, um, and it's a great it's a great resource uh, where you can really get into Bible study. One of the things that I've noticed in the time that I do what I do is how many people depend upon whoever's got the microphone on Wednesdays or Sundays or Tuesdays or Thursdays or whenever the buildings meet uh, or when people meet in house church and they don't do Bible study on their own. And I think it's really hurt us, especially if uh, something happens that we don't have Bible. So I just want to urge you to study your Bible. I look at mine every day. I'm in there every day. Uh, I don't think I'm special because of that. I use it because I write and I prepare these Bible studies, but it's we really need to know who we are in Christ, and that's the best way I know to figure that out. So we'll get into our Bible study. We're going to go back. We're going to start in 1330, but we're going to get a run and start on, on this. In Acts 13, 23, and I'm reading from the eSword right now on my desktop. I'm going to go Acts 13, 23, and I'm going to skip down some. He's talking about David in Acts 13, 22, and before that, and he says, from this man's seed, in other words, in this man's lineage, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. And so um, it skips down. It says in Acts 13, 27, for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, because they did not know Jesus, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them, have fulfilled what the, um, what the scriptures have said through the, through the prophets. We looked at this last time. 
um, in condemning him and condemning Jesus. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Acts 13, 20 now, 9. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from a tree and laid him in the tomb, but God raised him from the dead. That's verse 30, and that's where we are now. But God raised him from the dead. And so God lifted him up out of death. Not only that, there were witnesses. And so that's going to be important. Hey, I love you too, Jake. It's good to see you. Hi, hi, Liz. Hi, Gary. It's good to see you all here. Um, and so not only did God raise him from the dead, Acts 30, 13, 30, but there were witnesses. People saw that. Now, remember that the word witness simply means someone who says what they saw. And when we're being asked to witness um, by leaders in the body of Christ, uh, a lot of times they'll have programs and everything. Basically, the best witness in there ever is, is to say what we have seen God do in our life. Hi, hey, Jennifer. Say uh, what we have experienced in Christ. That's the best witness there is. And so there's a list of witnesses, and if you want, I can um, paste this. Um, let me see if I can find this real easily um, because I'm 20 pages ahead of this. I'm going to paste this list after I read it. But um, it's kind of cool to do this on a computer because you can, you can um, – get a lot done here and use multimedia to do things. So the list of people who um, who witnessed that Jesus was raised from the dead. Acts 13, 31 says that he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And here's the list. It's impressive. Mary Magdalene. I'm going to give all the scriptures that will be in the comments. Here and you can go look it up and see if you disagree. Mary Magdalene, the other women at the tomb, Peter in Jerusalem, 10 disciples that were in a room, all 11 surviving disciples. Remember that, that uh, Judas killed himself or died. Um, seven disciples who were fishing, 11 disciples on a mountain in Galilee. And so I'm a, I'm a quote here. I'll paste this. Into, um, into our Bible study. I'll probably put this also when I upload the video later. Plus, there were others in addition to that. There were two travel the two travelers on the road to Emmaus who walked with Jesus. There were 500 people and Jesus' brother James, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 6, and 7, and all those who watched Jesus ascend back into heaven. And so um, there's a lot of people. And then Paul, who saw him um, later when he was on his way to, to um, Damascus. And so years later, Paul becomes a witness too. Quite, a, quite an impressive list of people who saw that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, why is this important? It's important because in Jewish law, a valid witness must have seen the event with his eyes or heard it with his own ears. The testimony of two witnesses in Jewish law is equal in its force to the testimony of three or more witnesses. Generally, hearsay from another person is inadmissible. So there's some scriptures about that. Uh, one of them is Deuteronomy 19.15. In Deuteronomy 19.15, this is what it said. One witness shall not rise up against a man concerning any iniquity or sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So here we see that over 500 people saw that Jesus rose from the dead. So it mattered to these Jewish people where Paul was speaking in Antioch of Pisidia, and it mattered to the Gentiles there that someone had witnessed the risen Jesus with their own eyes. And that's why Paul mentions that. You know, he had to be dead or they wouldn't have buried him. They wouldn't have let him off the cross. They wouldn't have buried him. So they know definitely he was dead for three days. And then he rises from the dead. And uh, nobody sees him actually come alive from the dead. 
but people have seen that he had been risen. In Acts 13, 32, I just want to say that of all the other leaders, of all the other major world religions, only Jesus has witnesses that he raised from the dead. The rest are still lying in their tombs, uh, decomposing. Acts 13, 32, and we declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers. Now notice that Paul says we. Even though Luke says that the group is, well, he refers to him in Acts 13, 13 as Paul's party, he obviously sees what he's doing as, as he speaks in the synagogue in uh, Antioch of Presidia. He sees it as a team effort. Now the term um, declare glad tidings is a Greek word, you you which loathe, I had a hand, you which Anyway, it's the word that we get eulogy from. E-U-G-G-E-L-I-Z-O. All I know is I-Z-O is pronounced Itzo. From which we get the words evangelism, and we also get the word eulogy. Eulogizo. I guess that's how you say it. It simply means to announce good news. Now, Paul says that this good news is the promise which was made to the fathers. Next, Paul will back the statement up with some Old Testament verses with, with which these Jewish people are familiar. He's going to speak out of Psalm 2, verse 7, Isaiah 53, verse 3, and Psalm 16, 10. So he's going to quote out of these verses. And so I'll quote those right here. Um, I'm just going to paste what those verses are as soon as my word behaves and does what I want it to do. Um, I miss the days when I had somebody sitting with me who could just paste this stuff. Um, and so those are the verses that he's going to draw from. He's going to quote them in his text. These are all verses that the Jews of the day used in reference to Messiah. So he goes on and speaks in Acts 13, 33. God has fulfilled this for their children. Remember he just said in 32, I'll go 32 and 33. Hey, Jeff. Um, and we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, Acts 13, 32 and verse 33. God has fulfilled this for us, their children. Notice that he's, he's uh, including him, us. I'm a Jew too, right? Uh, that's what he's saying. Um, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as is also written in, written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have, I have begotten you, Acts 13, 33. Uh, psalm 2-7 goes just like this. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And so he's directly quoting uh, what, he's, what he knows he's memorized and they've memorized out of the Psalms. Did you ever wonder what it was like to be Paul? Paul was a highly educated Pharisee, training to be the high priest someday. Suddenly he met the Lord Jesus while on his way to Damascus to torment some Jewish Christians. He knew all these scriptures that he was quoting to these people in the synagogue this day in Acts 13. And he viewed them through the same spiritual filters that they were viewing them through while he's talking to them. Then he met the Messiah that those verses talked about and was born again. Imagine what it was like for him to have to rethink everything he believed as a Jew and then come to see those things from this side of the cross. There came a time when he thought about Psalm 2-7 and suddenly realized this, this scripture has been fulfilled. Wow. I would imagine that as he quoted it to these people, he hoped that would happen for them as well that they would see it like he saw it on the road to Damascus. 
How shocking it must have been to those listening to him to realize that in Psalm 2-7, God the Father refers to Jesus as his son. This was publicly acknowledged in two places in the, in the Gospel of Luke. And so there's two places in the Gospel of Luke. Remember, Luke is writing um, the book of Acts. Uh, the first in which there's two places in Luke's gospel in which God refers to Jesus as his beloved son. The first is in Luke 3.22, uh, when he was being baptized by uh, John the baptizer. He says, And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, upon Jesus, and a voice came from heaven, which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. The second time was in Luke 9.35, when it says, and this is when, I, th I believe it's when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him or listen to him. Both these events were actually the fulfillment of Psalm 2.7. Now going back to Acts 13 and verse 34. So we'll look at 33 too, because he, goes, he says, and. He says, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And in verse 34, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. And Paul reminds them that God promised that the Messiah's body would never decay. That's what that word um, corruption means. In verse uh, in Isaiah 55, verse 3, Isaiah, God says this through Isaiah. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting co covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. And this verse in Acts means more than we tend to think it does. He raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. When we hear that, what do we think it means? Well, we think it means that Jesus died and isn't dead anymore, right? Well, I believe it means that, but it means much more in addition. I'm told that from our conception, when we're conceived in our mother's womb, our souls begin to die. These are, are replaced as they die when our cells die off faster than they're replaced then we call that the dying process or uh, at the beginning the aging process i tell people all the time that we're all dying it's just that some people are more efficient at it than others everything on the earth including our physical bodies degrades and falls apart eventually and scientists refer to this as the second law of thermodynamics. I believe that corruption, when it says he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, I believe that corruption has to do with living in a physical body subject to the effects of the fall of man. A huge part of the sacrifice Jesus made for us was to come to live in a physical body at first that experienced that that his physical body was doing what all physical bodies did. So he was, he was in the process of the same thing we are in, where our cells die off all the whole time we're alive. When Jesus rose from the dead, he would never be subject to that corruption again. He wasn't going to, can you imagine what it's like to be God who made human bodies, who created everything, to live in a human body and feel it dying? Can you imagine that? I'm glad we don't actually sense that. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 to 57, Paul wrote, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the many titles Jesus has is to be found in Romans 8, verse 29. It's um, the firstborn of many. That's one of his titles. In Revelation, 
He's also known as the firstborn from the dead. And that's in Revelations 1, 5, the first half of the verse. This refers to the fact that he has, that he was the first to be raised from the dead like he was. No more to return to corruption for him. Jesus is the firstborn of many. And we who are saved are the many. Unless Jesus returns first, we'll all die eventually. And after that, we'll have to suffer. We'll never have to suffer again. For us too, there will be no more return to corruption. And that, my brothers and sisters, is really good news. Acts 13, 34, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. They also know that the Isaiah verse, Isaiah 55, 3, that we read earlier, refers back to a covenant made to King David by Nathan. And this was found in 2 Samuel 7, 15 and 16. I'm, I'm quoting all these things because, I don't know, as a Gentile, I didn't know all this. And I assume no other people, and most of the people watching these things uh, haven't. So we're looking at it so we can kind of look at it through the eyes of those Jewish people and those converts to Judaism that were there when Paul was speaking in the synagogue. In um, 2 Samuel 7, 15 through 5 through 16, verse 5 through 16. It's going to be a lengthy reading, but I think it's worthwhile. God says this to Samuel, go tell, go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, would you build the house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I've moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, why have, not, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the law, Lord of the hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I've been with you wherever you've gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a great name. Like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since that time, I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up a seed after you, speaking of Jesus, who will come from your body, so you'd be one of his ancestors, and I will, one of his subsequent ancestors and i will establish his kingdom he shall build the house for my name and i will establish the throne of his kingdom forever i will be his father and he shall be my son if he commits a day iniquity i will chasten him with the rod of men with the blows of the sons of men but my mercy shall not depart from him as i took it from saul whom i removed before you and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you, your throne shall be established forever. So Acts thirteen thirty four, and they that raised him, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus: I will give you the sure mercies of David. We have seen that this comes from Isaiah fifteen thirty three. Let's see more about those mercies. Psalm 89, verse 2 through 4. Hey, Rob, we're in um, Acts 13, 34. We saw that some of that came from Psalm, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, 15. I mean, 5 through 16. We've seen that some of it came from Isaiah 55, 3. Now we're going to see that some of it comes from Psalm 89, 2 to 4. 
For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness shall establish, you shall establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Now, Paul is speaking these things to Jews who know that this promise was made to David, but that David did not keep the throne forever since he died. He's pointing out, though, that God has kept his promise by extending the throne to someone with capital S, Jesus, who is in the lineage of David. And this one is everlasting. This, this covenant is everlasting, and this throne is everlasting. Acts 13, 35. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you shall not allow your Holy One to see corruption. In Hebrews, have you noticed that I'm pulling from all kinds of places? It's because when you start studying this, you'll see that all these things are interwoven all through the Old and New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, the writer speaks similar things to his Jewish Christian leaders. In Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. He says, now, this is the main point of the things we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister with a capital M of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. And this one lies forever, having been, lives forever haven't been resurrected. That's a bad typo. Um, Psalm 16, 9 to 10. Therefore, my heart is glad. And like you notice that he said in Acts, in Acts uh, 13, 35, therefore he also says something about this in another psalm. The other psalm is, Acts, is Psalm 16, 9 to 10. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruptions. Now, just to make sure his listeners heard him clearly, Paul says this in Acts 13, 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep. He died and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. Now, Paul honors King David by making sure he believes David, that he believes David served by the will of God. He knew that David was an icon for these people and that they highly revered him. A word about serving by the will of God. David did what he did. He served his own generation. How? By God's will. He did that because God wanted that, and God purposed that he would. And we are where we are on the earth, and when we are, because God chose this time and this place for us. And that's true, even if we don't feel like we fit in. And I think it's especially important that we realize it's true if we don't think we fit in wherever it is we are. God put us here. God put us here now in history. So Paul honored David here, yet it is also true that David died and was buried, and he, didn't, he wasn't resurrected, and that his body did eventually decay. Paul also honored him in how he said what he said here by comparing him to another king, the forever king, King Jesus. However, it is also true that the body of this eternal king of ours, in, in opposition to what happened with David, Jesus' body did not decay. Acts 13, 37. But he, who, he, Jesus, whom God raised up, saw no corruption. It was important that they see that Psalm 16, 9 to 10, which is a prophetic reference to the coming Messiah, was true. That it did not refer to David and that it did refer to Jesus, 
who was raised from the dead after just three days in the grave. It's likely that all those there had at one time visited David's tomb in which he remained buried. Acts 13, 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that th through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Now, the New American Standard Version says this in a different way. So it's the same verse, just a different version. It says, the King James, New King James says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that, it is, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. In the New American Standard, it says it like this. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sin is preached, proclaimed to you. Now, the first makes it seem, make it look like the preaching of forgiveness is through Jesus, while the second makes it look like forgiveness is through Jesus and is being preached. And do you know what I think? I think they're both true. The verse is literally saying the second one that forgiveness comes through Jesus, but it is also true that the preaching of truth is through Jesus and Jesus through us, if we allow him to operate through us. Galatians 2.20, which back in 1980, no, 1992, the first time I ever really embraced it, I mean, I, I encourage, memorize Galatians 2.20 and embrace it for yourself. This is what it says, the Apostle Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in my body, in my body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. The life that we lived, that's what I embraced in 1992, was the truth that it's not us who lives. It's Christ that lives in us. And it's possible for us to let, let Christ um, work through us on our jobs, parent through us as parents, uh, be obedient children through us as children. It's possible for us. I try to let Jesus teach through me. That's what my prayer is before I ever sit down and do this. Um, anytime I speak from a pulpit or in a living room or anywhere, I'm hoping that it's not Mike McInerney talking, it's Jesus speaking through me. I pray that Jesus writes articles for me. I should be releasing one soon about how we um, don't live being present. And I was convicted and wrote that article. Um, I was convicted about myself in that. Um, I'll be releasing that soon. I have another one. I have a note right here that as I was writing in here, I'm, I'm going to extract a part of the book of Acts study. And I'm going to, I was actually shown as I, as I use my notes from my original teaching that God is going to get more out of the whole idea of forgiveness out of what happens in um, the book of Acts. And um, I guess uh, later in this chapter, I guess, in here. And so, so I think both happens. I believe that forgiveness comes through Jesus, but Paul speaking about forgiveness, um, that the even teaching of it is happening through Jesus, through Paul. As Acts, as Paul speaks in Acts 13, 38. It is truly Christ preaching this to those people in the synagogue through Paul since Paul is walking in the Spirit. He says, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sin. It is through Jesus that our sins are forgiven. Now, the word forgiveness literally means freedom or pardon, P-A-R-D-O-N. But it means more than just being pardoned. Pardoned. It is freedom. It means that we no longer have to obey sin, although we still remain free to sin if we so choose. Now, as I went through this, it seemed to me that I should take a major detour, and I'm going to. I always want to be obedient to God, and I think he wants us to do this. So we're going to kind of put 
to Acts 13, study on hold a bit, while we go through Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 5. I, I encourage us to read Romans 6, 7, and 8 frequently out loud to ourselves. Read Galatians 5 out loud to ourselves. Read Colossians 3 and Ephesians, I'm sorry, Colossians 2 and Ephesians chapter 3 to ourselves out loud. It's just powerful stuff. Put ourselves in there. So in, Act, in Romans 6, verses 5 to 7, remember Jesus just said, I mean, um, Paul just said, it's through this man Jesus has preached to you the forgiveness of sins, the freedom from sin. Well, we're going to look at, at what Paul learned by the time he got to write this letter to the Romans about that topic. In Romans 6, 5 through 7, he says this, for, or if, for if or since we have been united together in the likeness of Jesus' death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, knowing this fact, that our old man was crucified with him. When I do my conference, I go into this deeply. The term old man is paleos anthropos. It means decrepit, outmoded, uh, run down, um, fallen apart um, person that we were before we say That our old man was crucified along with Jesus. Why? So that the body of sin might be done away with. Why? so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So here we have uh, Jesus dying on the cross, and uh, we see that in the scriptures. And then we see Paul talking to these people in Acts 13, saying that through this man is forgiveness of sins, freedom from sins. Here we have in Romans 6, um, prior to being born again, Paul said that we were slaves to sin. It meant that we were virtually powerless to resist Satan, when now we've been freed. Forgiveness of sin, freedom from sin. Galatians 5, 1a says it was for freedom that Christ, that Christ set us free. So you see how all three of these tie together. I hope, I hope it makes as much sense to you as it does to me. That means that now we do have a choice. We used to be slaves, now we don't. In Romans, now we're not. Um, we have a choice. We can be slaves to sin or something else. In Romans 6:16, 6, Paul goes on. He says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that person, that one's slaves whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Now, a typical slave, are they free? No. They have to obey their master. Well, what, what he's saying here is that when Christ uh, gave us forgiveness of sins and freedom from sins. So not just that our sins were taken off our record, but also now he's given us the ability to resist sin as a master. He says, and now you get to choose, whereas a typical slave doesn't. Now we get to choose. Are we going to present ourselves to sin and say, do whatever you want to do with this? You know, I, I taught this once in a prison in Houston, it was, it was a real God deal. I was on my way down to Houston to go to a conference, and um, when I went into the, to the book tent of this, I met a friend of mine who was a um, chaplain at a state prison that used to be in Houston, and he invited me to deliver the message on Sunday in their church service, so I did. Well, this was a pre-release facility, so every one of these men were going to get out and, and be out of prison soon. And, and so when I was talking about this, I said um, for them to imagine the person on the streets who they knew just hated them and would want to destroy them. And they said, okay, we have that. And I said, imagine going up to that person when you got out of prison. Go up to that person that you know has nothing but bad intentions for you and say, hey, I want to present myself to you to do with as you see fit. And one of the prisoners stood up and he said, man, you're out of your mind. And I said, but isn't that what happens? I said, a lot of you guys get out of prison. Then I see you back in the county jail. Because you go right out to your old master, sin, and you go right up to him. And you say, hey, you did it to me before. Do it to me again. We get to choose. We get to choose. We've been freed from sin. We've, been, we've experienced forgiveness 
of sin, which we see that part of the definition of forgiveness means freedom. We don't have to sin. We don't have to obey any kind of compulsions. We don't have to to um to have anything. We don't have to um, be be a slave to fear or slave to control or slave to anxiety or a slave to depression. We could choose against that, and we can be free from sin too. So I sometimes wonder why we choose to sin when Jesus paid so much for us to have the freedom to choose to not sin. Then I realize it's because we don't seem to spend a lot of time meditating on exactly what all it cost him. We just seem excited about how we benefit, but every good thing has a cost. Perhaps if we'd spend time on that, we won't choose to do things that Jesus hates as much as, as we do. Acts 13, 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sin. So we might grasp better how important this is. Let's take a little trip back through Paul's spiritual logic, starting in Romans 6, 3. This trip will land us right back where we are, uh, right back here in Romans 6, 16, but it'll be worth the trip, I promise. So in Acts 6, 3, he says, do you not know that as many as us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. And most Christians, my experience is most Christians don't know the mechanism, if you will, by which we become born again. Paul says that we're baptized into Christ, in other words, placed into him when we're saved. And this happens when we express our desire to belong to him, Romans 10, 6 um, to 10. Romans 10, I'm sorry. 9 to 10, when we confess Jesus as our Lord. In Romans 6, 4, he says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism and the death, just as Christ was raised from the dead, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also would walk in the newness of life. This happened so that we could live differently, so we can walk in the newness of life. Why was this necessary? It is because our old way of living was to be in bondage to sin. And this happened so we could live differently. Being buried with Christ is a good thing. Being raised with Christ is even better. Christians get to experience both. He says in, in Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism, which, in which you were also raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. Everything that happens to us in Christ is for a reason. In Romans 6, 5, he says, For if we've been united with him together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And the Father's anticipation was that being united with Christ in death, we would look like him in the resurrected life. We would come to live after rising from the dead with Jesus. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we'd no longer be slaves to sin. He wanted us to know, knowing this. He wanted us to know that the old person we used to be, the habitual sinner in bondage to sin, died forever so we would no longer be slaves in bondage to sin. Isn't this a grand plan? In Romans 6, 7, he says, For he who has died has been freed from sin. And it's a fact. Dead people are free from sin. In Romans 6, 8 to 9. Now, if we live with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. If we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Remember that the wages of payoff of bondage to sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Living as those raised from the dead are those as those who are raised from having to live in the wages of sin allows us to harvest that freedom that Paul was telling those people about in that synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia as recorded in Acts 13. Romans 6.10, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. 
Jesus took us with himself through that. We died to sin once and for all. We no longer have to obey sin. So let's live this life to God and not present ourselves to sin. The next verse in Romans is the kicker. Our perception is so important. Not to fake our perception to try to make something be true. That's a form of sorcery. Rather, to see what is true and to agree with it. To perceive things as they truly are. In this case, it means to live as those raised from the dead, as those who are raised from having to live in the wages of sin. God told us that we died, past tense, to being slaves to sin. In reality, we are free. But if we don't truly agree with that, will we live it? No, we won't. And that's why Paul says this next in Romans 6.11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This means that we are to choose to see ourselves. That is perception. We are to choose to see ourselves as those dead to that bondage, as free ones. Why? Because we are free. As Paul teaches this, he acknowledges that we have a choice. We are free really free to do either. Before, as slaves to sin, we were not free. We had to sin. Now we can sin and suffer the consequences, of course, or we can choose to resist temptation and not sin. See, that is freedom. Either way, it's our responsibility, but now we're free to make the choice. That's why Paul was saying, way back in Acts 13, 23, I'm sorry, 33. Wait, let me go on. No, 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the freedom, the forgiveness of sins. That's why he used the word that meant that. And that's why we're going through this detour through Romans 6. So either way, now that we're free, it's our, it's our responsibility. Before, Satan was leading us into it, and we were a slave to that. In Romans 6, 11 to 12, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey in its lust. In other words, I mean, look how it says, don't let this happen. How could, we, how could we be told that if it wasn't true that we have the right to resist it? Now we have the right to resist that. We are free to not allow something else to rule us. We are free to not allow sin to rule us, and we are equally free to not let Jesus rule us. And this is not a passive life that we've been given the right to live. We must make a choice. We must choose. It's our privilege to choose. So which will it be? Hopefully, it'll be this choice. Romans 6, 12 to 13. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey in its lust and do not present the members of your, your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Then he gives them instead. But instead, present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. We are those who are finally truly free. He says he is preaching through this man forgiveness of sins in Acts 13, 38. That's what this is all about. We're truly free. We have the right to present ourselves to be used by sin, to let sin use us. And I'll, I'll just say, if sin has a chance, it will not only use us, it will use us up. So we can let sin use us, or we can present ourselves to Jesus to let him utilize us. If we choose Jesus moment by moment, we will be a part of the building of his kingdom in us and then through us out into the world. If we choose sin as a master, we will be a part of nothing positive being built because sin tears down. All sin tears down. And Paul encourages not to choose that 
when he says, present yourselves as God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Romans 6, 13. This is sobering, isn't it? It's important. It's crucial and it's awesome. So Paul goes on a few sentences later to say this in summary. Acts, I mean, Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? Isn't that an awesome concept? What are you going to pick? Are you going to say, well, I could do this thing that I know is a sin. I can obey that, and I will become its slave. Or I can choose God, who has a track record for, for doing things that cost him so we could benefit. I can choose to obey him, become his slave that will result in righteousness. He says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are the one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, leading to righteousness. I think in everyday life, when Satan does pretty much what he did with Eve, when he holds out some benefit, he says, here, where's my hand? Here, take, man, that's, that's irritating, isn't it? Uh, when, when he holds something out and he says, here, take this. Oh, here are all the benefits to it. And, and we have our blinders on and we say, okay, I can do this thing that I know is wrong, but I'll get this benefit out of it. We don't see the fact that at the end of that, there's going to be a sensation of death and maybe eternal death. We don't look at it. We just let it do it, whatever it wants to do to us. We live kind of on autopilot. We live by our appetites. We live going, I want this. And I'm going to get this, and I don't really care what it costs me until we're laying there and things are going wrong and everything's falling apart. And we go, I don't know why God's doing this to me. We do it to us. He doesn't. In Christ, we get to moment by moment choose our master. Outside of Christ, before we were saved, we never had that chance. We never had that option. Now we do. So let's actively choose Jesus. In the word of Moses, which was spoken long before Jesus showed up on the earth, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 and 20, Moses said this, I call heaven and earth, and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you, and I'm going to say, I'm going to paraphrase, two things. Life and death, blessing, life, and cursing, death. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. Why? For he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. I think about that, that passage in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 and 20, a lot. The compassion of, of Moses saying, it's almost like he's saying, please choose life. Don't choose death. Please choose blessings and life. Don't choose cursing and death. Well, he says, so I urge you, that you may love the Lord, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him. For he is your life in the length of your days and, and that you may dwell in the land. You know, God has intentions for us. You know, a lot of evangelists say this and it comes out of the scriptures that God has a beautiful plan for your life. He says, I know, I know the plans I have for you to bless you and curse you not. So, so he has a plan for us. That's the land that, that, that um, Moses was talking about. As it was then, it is for now, now for us in Christ. Which will it be? What are we going to choose? When someone points out to us that what we're doing is sin, 
when the scriptures do, when the Holy Spirit nudges us or, or pinches us or however he convicts you. Sometimes when he convicts me, it's like I've been stabbed in the heart. When he does, what are we going to do? Are we going to ignore that? We're going to push past it like it's some kind of Holy Spirit indigestion. We're going to keep doing what we're doing to get some earthly thing, some temporary relief or some temporary something that's going to go away. The Father loves us so much. He loves us so much that he placed himself at risk of disappointment and pain and agony should we choose sin as our master. We go through that. We're not the only one that feels the death. God is with us. He experiences it with us. And it was worth it to him that we'd be free. We have such an awesome father. He is real love. We just took a short detour into Romans after reading this verse in Acts. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, Jesus, has preached to you the forgiveness of sin. And we saw that one of the um, expanded definition of forgiveness was not just to be like have the sin taken off our record, but also cleansed out of us, but also that the death grip of that master of sin be ripped away from us so that we could be free to resist sin. Sometimes people will ask me why I take so many rabbit trails when I teach, and my answer is that I try my best to follow the Holy Spirit as I teach. This last detour was because I sensed that I needed to do that. That God and the Holy Spirit wanted me to do that because somebody that's either watching us now or will watch it later when it's posted to YouTube, um, that somebody needed to hear it. Maybe I needed to hear it again. For this reason, it's not a detour at all. Rather, it's an act of obedience to an active God who is always alive and always paying attention. And I'm telling you, I'll never apologize for obeying the Lord. Acts 13, 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sin, sins. Now, Paul has just led his listeners in that synagogue right up to Jesus. The therefore, therefore, let it be known. The therefore in Acts 13 38 means that based on an incredible fact I just ch shared, do something. The something, let it be known to you, is some valuable information that through this man, Jesus, has preached to you the forgiveness of sin. Before looking at Romans 6, we talked about how this means that it's through Jesus in us that this is preached and about how it also means that forgiveness itself comes through Jesus. We also define forgiveness as several things, pardon, deliverance, forgiveness as we know it, liberty, and remission. We talked about how it not only removes the offenses from our record, and this is so cool, but it also gives us liberty from those offenses and their effects. It is amazing how few Christians seem to understand that there are many sins we've committed that can have a lasting effect on us. This doesn't just mean the earthly consequences. What I'm talking about is the lasting bondages that, to those sins that take root in our hearts, making us slaves to them. And these cause us to think, decide, and feel things that further affects our behaviors. When Paul says that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, he means that forgiveness also addresses this. Forgiveness brings liberty and freedom from having to obey those things. Forgiveness of sins is huge. When we receive this truth, and that is our primary responsibility in this, it is important that we walk in it our secondary uh, responsibility, and apply it to those besetting sins and resulting bondages, which is our tertiary or third-level responsibility. A lot of what we call deliverance 
or is called deliverance in some parts of the body of Christ. In fact, it's just that. Applying the freedom we have in Jesus to the leftover bondages in our souls and allowing the Lord and walking in partnership with him to work his freedom throughout our lives. Well, I'm going to stop there. I appreciate those of you who came on Tuesday, even though this is supposed to be a Monday night Bible study. I had something very important to do this weekend. Five years ago yesterday, our third granddaughter, Annalise, was born. Uh, Laurie and I were there in Kansas City, and it was just as cold there as it is all over the United States right now. It was snowing and sleeting, and, and anyway, um, Yesterday was her fifth birthday, and Lori and I flew out yesterday, Saturday, and spent three days with them, had a birthday party with them in St. Louis, and, and then we flew back late last night. We were on a plane when the Bible study would have started. Well, we're in the airport with spotty reception. So I decided it'd be better that we do the Bible study on Tuesday. Um, I um, started today by saying that there is a program called eSword. It's a Bible program. You can get the King James for free. I recommend that people do that. I use it a lot. It's a wonderful program. You can get all kinds of versions of the Bible. Um, I recommend that you get it and you make a donation to them because they put it out there for the Bible to be available on computers for free. Um, I have, I don't know, 30 versions of the Bible, 20 or 25 commentaries, several Bible dictionaries, and I use it a lot. I, I wear it out. I have it on all my computers. So I recommend that. Later on this website, I will have uh, the latest um, video. You click on a video a thing later when I upload this thing to, to um, YouTube, it'll be on my website. You can also click on the articles, and there'll be a bunch of articles there. Um, thank you, Billy. Isn't it a great tool? I love it. And um, I recommend that everybody use these sort. Uh, I've had a bunch of different kinds, and they're all good, but this is just an amazing and real intuitive program. And so we're going to pray, and then next week we'll be meeting on Monday. Uh, unless the Lord says something different. Thank you for coming. It's a lot more fun when there's other people being a part of study. Father, I ask you to bless all those who are here, all those who might be ill. I ask you to uh, send your healing to them. Father, those who uh, weren't able to make it, I ask you to make it available to them online. I thank you for those who come. I thank you for those who, um, there's a lot who come who know more than I know for sure, and I'm humbled that they come to this Bible study. I ask you to be with those, Father, that, that uh, weren't able to make it today especially. And I ask you to bless us, Father, and bring us back together again next time. And, Father, I ask you to remind us all that meeting over the Internet like this is great, but it never replaces the face-to-face -face contact of fellowship in the body of Christ in whatever form it takes. So I ask you to remind us to have a meal with somebody, meet for worship with somebody, do something with somebody else in the body of Christ. And I praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. I will see you next time. Love y'all. See you later. Bye-bye.